every time. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you, God, that we can come to you today, and we can worship you, God, and we can sing your praises. Uh, God, thank you for our visitors this morning. God, thank you for the lovely day. God, sometimes we uh, we uh, just take the weather and the niceness or the badness of the weather for granted, but you're in control of everything in the universe, and God, thank you, you've made it a good, pleasant day. I pray you just help folks to look at the nice blue skies, and thank you, uh, for God giving them a good day. And I pray they'll come out and worship you, God, and help help our folks. God, thank you that the folks that are here this morning are here, and I pray you just give them something from on high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, Y'all may be seated. Um, in a few minutes, I'm, I'm going to have this gentleman and his wife, Gary and Joy uh, Sprunger, right? Okay. Uh, there, uh, he is the uh, Caribbean director for uh, BIMI, uh, which is a missions board. Uh, Brother Tamang is, is with that board, and we know Brother Tamang, love Brother Tamang, and uh, I'm hoping this brother tells us a little about about what's going on in Haiti and some of the things down there. Uh, they've had they've had a couple rough years of hurricanes and storms down there. They really have. Um, I don't know, I've been looking for another Haitian boat boat fleet. Because <laughs> I remember back a few years ago, remember, remember the Haitian boat people we had? Um, but, you know, sometimes I don't blame people. of The country they're in so bad. Uh, then again, uh, some of them need to stay in their country and make the country better. Sometimes I think that's the case. All right. Um, if, if, all right, Brother Gary, why don't you come up and talk to us a few minutes about what you do and... and uh, What's going on in the Caribbean? Thank you, Pastor. It's good to be here at Open Door Baptist Church today. My wife and I uh, did not have anything scheduled this morning. We said, we're going to come visit y'all. Remember when you were located out on the 
uh, Old Mobile Highway, and uh, I had lost track of where you were. And recently, I got the the crossroads here. I said, I know where that's at. And so it worked out well this morning. We could be here. We thank the Lord for this church and your faithfulness in serving the Lord. In Psalm 150, David penned this, Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in, his, in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. You know, folks, we have the opportunity of praising the Lord today. I often tell people that John and I don't do much. We're just good reporters. We just report on what God's doing. Amen. And I tell folks that's not fake news either. Amen. You know, it's a real thing. I Amen. thank the Lord that at 10 years old, I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. Amen was in a union meeting up in northern Indiana, and up there every year they'd bring in a special preacher, and they would have a combined uh, citywide meeting, and that year they invited Dr. Uh, Lehman Strauss to come, and I remember I was in a youth choir, sitting in, uh, sitting in a great big auditorium, it was a Mennonite church, and up in the choir loft, and that night Dr. Lehman Strauss preached on hell. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I came under conviction. The only problem was when the invitation was given, but now I was in the middle of 150 kids and couldn't bury myself out of that out of that choir loft. But I went home under conviction. When I got home that night, I knelt beside my bed and opened Amen. my heart's door and accepted Christ as my Savior. Amen. He changed my life. Yes. When I was in uh, high school, I... Uh, Walked the aisle and said, Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go <laughs> at a missions conference, but Lord, please don't send me to Africa. <laughs> I thought, oh no, Lord, I'll go anywhere else, but I was not impressed about going to Africa for some reason. But you know, Lord has a sense of humor, I think. Yeah. Because as I was in college, I met my wife in a calculus class, ended up flunking out of college, and went on to Tennessee Temple and was in a missions conference and God spoke to my heart and said, Gary, I want you to go to the West Indies and be a church planter, missionary pilot down there mm -hmm. and meet the need of, of the missionaries. And I thought, Lord, you just called the wrong fella. <laughs> well, Lord, I'd already flunked out of college. I'm not smart. And the Lord just confirmed, said, I'm calling you. You're the one. You know, it's amazing how God yeah. can use even simple folks like me. And he can use you. Amen. And God just wants to demonstrate his greatness. Well, my wife and I, two years later, were down in the West Indies. God provided us with an airplane. We lived in St. Thomas to begin with and began to service all the islands throughout the Caribbean, working with uh, independent fundamental Baptist missionaries, helping the Blue Water Bible College. And God used that as a stepping stone in order to introduce us to all the islands and the different cultures Amen. and the different needs and the different languages yeah, down there. And little did I ever know what God would have in store in the future. We were busy helping start churches, starting churches. Ultimately, we ended up in Puerto Rico for 34 years. I was pastor at Maranatha Baptist Church, a military work, and we had the thrill of seeing folks get saved and have a Christian school where we were able to, uh, to discipleship young people. And oh, what a thrill it was just to see what God was doing by using us out there. We didn't do anything. God did it all. And now I've been the Caribbean director out there, the West Indies, traveling all over. It's the time of our lives. We're not, we're not old. We're young. Young at heart. Don't ask us how old we are. That might lie. But anyhow, uh, we are thrilled to be serving the Lord. Pastor, it's a joy to see Amen. what God's doing in spite of the pandemic last year. Amen. In the city called San Francisco de Marconis, in the middle of the Dominican Republic, we have a missionary by the name of Eric Johnson there. 
has started already three churches and a national came back for the United States. He and his dear wife by the name of Carlos and Rosita Ventura. And Carlos had been living in Rock Hill, South Carolina and was a member at Southside Baptist Church, a soul winning missionary minded church. And he and his wife came back to retire in the Dominican Republic and he went to Brother Johnson. He said, Brother Johnson said, we got a bird. We got to start a new church out here someplace. And Brother Johnson said, well, well, Carlos, I've been praying that we could buy this land on the southeast corner of this city of about 110,000 people. God provided the land. They were able to buy it. Carlos and Rosita went out there and the first thing they did is they put up bamboo poles and they put corrugated zinc over the top and they started reaching people out there. Amen. I was down there three months ago and what a thrill it was to hear and to see the videos of what's going on. <laughs> on this morning they probably had between 75 and 90 people oh, there right. at that bamboo oh, church. Yeah. And folks are getting saved that God's doing a great work. And God is in the midst of winning souls Amen. in the Caribbean. Well, Pastor, let me tell you about Haiti right now. Yes, please. You heard about the prime minister that was killed. The prime minister had come from the city of Puerto Bay. Puerto Bay is up in the northwest corner. I've been there numerous times. And we have a ministry going on up there. Brother Don Dryden and his son Benji Dryden have worked that area. And they have eight churches started up there. And they have a Bible Institute with over 150 Haitian Amen. men in it. It's a five-year program. And they, they train these men in the Word of God. And they teach them to think biblically in a non-biblical society. And it is exciting. Every year we're seeing 25, 30 men graduating out of that ministry and going out and are literally impacting that whole northwest corner of Haiti. The man who was a prime minister was known personally. He was a businessman. Very conservative. Very uh, well thought of up there. And... When he went into the government, he inherited a major problem because Haiti had borrowed so many millions of dollars in oil reserves from Venezuela. Venezuela was supplying fuel to them for their buses and for their cars and so on. And the, Venez and the Haitian government had not paid back their dues. And so, as a result, this new prime minister told the people that the uh, price of fuel was going to have to go up. They were going to pay off what they owed Venezuela. Well, as an outcome, I'm sure that he upset some people. Boy. And ultimately, yeah. he was assassinated. Yes. Wow. It has literally thrown Haiti into a major turmoil. Yeah. As you know, the one thing that this last president didn't want is to invite the UN in to oversee the, the justice system there because in the past the UN has done some very uh, discupulous acts. Yeah. It was told to me up there in, in Puerto Rico, a man who was raising some cattle, some hogs, a man came and stole four, four hogs out of, his, out of his herd. And this fellow went to the UN uh, key officer and said, this man stole four hogs. They went and got him and they said, did you steal hogs from this farmer? And he said, yeah. I wanted them. So the UN officer said to the thief, well, give him two back. You keep two for yourself. That's justice in the eyes of the UN, all right? You have to understand, Haitians don't have bank accounts, they have cattle accounts. Yeah. What they raise on their own land is their bank account. So in, 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 in uh, colloquial words here, somebody stole money out of his bank. Well, 
This man who had been the prime minister had a desire to have things done right and in order. And I'm sure that as an act, somebody uh, eliminated him. And now Haiti is in turmoil. Uh, we're praying that our missionary will be able to get back in to Haiti right now. He's stateside. And it's typical around the world, we have a lot of areas where our missionaries have had to come out of because of the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and are not able to get back in and, and the governments are changing their demands all the time. It was just a little over a month ago, I was in Freeport of uh, the Bahamas helping Pastor Hall. A year ago, their church was completely eliminated because of the Hurricane Dorian. And as of the scope of that, they had nowhere to meet except to rent a small building, a room about this side right here. And they were packed in and they'd been praying that God would help them raise the money to rebuild. One of our missionaries by the name of Brother Ford passed away. He had worked out there and he worked with deaf people on that island. And he left his estate to help that church rebuild. Wow. And so... He told us, please sell my estate, whatever is able to be procured from it, please see to it that it gets into the hands of that church. And I was appointed by BMI to be the executor of that, of that money. And so I went there to see Pastor Hall and spent four days, a wonderful weekend with him, and to see what God's doing down there. Oh, I was, my heart was thrilled because souls are being saved. They've got a goal to reach people on that island. And it's located clear out at 8 Mile Rock, which uh, is 8 miles away from Freeport proper, out on the most western end of that island. But there's a large community out there that they're reaching with the gospel. Well, that's just the beginning of what's taking place out in the Caribbean. We need your prayers. Joy and I are still going strong. We're uh, actively involved in a lot of ministries. And pray for our missionaries right now. Pray for the the radio ministry in, in Antigua. We have the Caribbean Radio Lighthouse. It's beaming the gospel both in, in uh, uh, Spanish and English 24 hours a day. And this last year, because of the COVID, the government closed its, its doors. And they finally got to dealing with the paperwork that we've submitted for five years in order to get in good standing with the government. And finally, about uh, three months into the COVID, we got a notice from the government that Caribbean Radio Lighthouse had been, has been given the position of in good standing with Antigua and Barbuda. And that means now that we're able to ask for a new uh, uh, frequency and our goal and our prayer is the Lord will let us broadcast 24-7 in French yet also because we have Guadeloupe just about 30-40 no. miles to the south and that is a half a million uh, uh, people there that speak French no. and we'd like to beam the gospel into that French speaking island as well as other parts of the Caribbean. So God's on the throne. He's doing some great Amen. things. And I just want to share that he should be praised. Amen. Well, ain't that, ain't that wonderful? Amen. You know, no matter where God sends people, he can work. And uh, I'm, I'm going to go preach at a missions conference next month in Iowa. And one, one of the sermons God's given me is... Um, about us being God's hands. Uh, God's not here to do stuff. We're the ones that he's left to do stuff for him. And uh, all it takes is a will and heart. Amen? People with will and hearts. Well, thank you for coming by, brother. Thank you for that report. That, that's a blessing. Amen. Um, keep praying for the folks in Haiti. Uh, I guess between the storm and all the political intrigues they probably uh have such a mess to clean up I, i'm 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 glad that uh we haven't got to that stage in the united states yet <laughs> all right uh in your bibles uh this morning turn to jeremiah 34 jeremiah 34 now 
Last week I preached from Jeremiah, so this is the next chapter from 33, but this is, uh, this is a little different. And uh, I'm going to preach on taking God's second chance. You know, God is the God of second chances. Very few times in the Bible does he just totally cut people off and say, you're done. Uh, most everybody in the Bible gets a second chance. Some people get more than a second chance. Um, I wonder how many chances I've gone through as a Christian. Um, you know, God's very good to us as his children. Uh, and if God ever gets you, you know, if you disappoint God, uh, you, uh, you really feel like, well, I've really messed up, um, pray. God will give you a second chance. And when that second chance comes along, take it. Take it. Don't feel ashamed. Don't feel like you don't deserve it. God wouldn't give it to you if he didn't want you to have it. Jeremiah chapter 34 verse 1. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, uh, the king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them unto the house of the Lord and one of the chamber. I'm in the wrong chapter, aren't I? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, back up. The word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord. Yeah, I see why I got messed up. Same, same beginning. Uh, when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, yeah, that sounds right, uh, and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth of his dominion and all the people fought against Jerusalem and against all the cities thereof, saying, Thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, Go and speak unto Zedekiah, king of Judah, and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. So God tells them exactly what's going to happen. And if thou shalt not escape, and thou shalt not escape out of his hand, but shall surely be taken and delivered into his hand. So he tells him, look, you're going to be taken and the king of Babylon is going to take you prisoner. And thine eyes shall behold the eyes of the king of Babylon. He's going to look you in the eyes. And he shall speak with thee month to month, mouth to mouth. Not month to month, mouth to mouth. I might have to go to the eye doctor. That's, that's all there is to it. And thou shalt go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of the Lord, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus saith the Lord of thee, Thou shalt not die by sword, but thou shalt die in peace with the burnings of thy father and the former kings which were before thee, so shall they burn odors for thee and shall lament thee, saying, Ah, Lord, for I have pronounced the word, saith the Lord. Heavenly Father, help us, Lord. Uh, help us to remember that there's always hope, even in the worst situation, God. Um, Lord, this man here, uh, he had a chance to have a second chance. And he didn't take it, God. I pray you just help us in this country to take the second chance. Uh, there was a missionary uh, preaching in a village in North uh, India uh, back years and years ago. And he was preaching in uh, the bazaar area, which is their version of a shopping center. And when he closed his message, uh, a Muslim came up to him and told him he thought Islam was better than Christianity. Uh, he, he said, well, we have a prophet in Mecca. Uh, he's buried there. The Christians, well, they go to Jerusalem and they just have an empty tomb. And the missionary kind of laughed and smiled and said, yeah, that's the difference, all right. Jesus is alive and Muhammad is dead. Uh, look, um, that guy got a second chance of that. And he didn't take it. Uh, you know, a lot of people got goofy ideas. Uh, Zedekiah had some very strange ideas. He was more scared of what the people thought of him than he was of God. Uh, you're in real trouble when you get more scared of people than you are of God. Don't be scared of people. You know, people are just like you. Uh, God is not. He's different. Um, I, I want to look at what God told Jeremiah here. I'm really not concerned about... Uh, Zedekiah. You have to really read uh, a couple chapters in there to get the full 
extent of what's going on. Basically, God said, look, if you'll go out of the city and you surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, I'll spare you and you can come back to the city and you can live here and everything going to be good. You'll serve Nebuchadnezzar, but you'll be alive and so will everybody else. Well, he didn't want to do that. He was going to prove what a good general he was, what a good king he was, and he was going to hold out to the end. Well, God said if he did that, he was going to, uh, he was going to die at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, and that's exactly what happened. But he gave him that second chance. And, and Jeremiah was told to go and talk to uh, Zedekiah. Uh, he was told three things here. First of all, he was given some direction. And the direction was to go. Now, God's directions aren't complicated. It's a two-letter word. Go. Go. Have you gone? You know, in Matthew chapter 28, Jesus said for us to go. We're to go. We're going to tell people about him. We're to, we're to start churches, baptize people, but we're to go. G-O. Two letters. There's not a little kid in here, or when we have them for Sunday school, that can't understand that word. When you're little bitty kids, you learn what the word go means. Go. Go. Some Christians have a real hard time with that. Uh, you know, they get off on the wrong course. Now, back when we were lost, I remember when I was lost. You remember when you were lost? Now, if you can't ever remember a time when you were lost, maybe you never got saved in the first place. I remember when I was lost. And you know what I found out when I got saved? I was going the wrong way. The wrong course. The wrong direction. Ephesians chapter 2, if you want to look at that, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2 and 3, uh, the Bible talks about this wrong direction we were going. We're in, uh, times in times past, we walked according to the course of this world. So he's talking about the past, when we were lost. We were walking along what the world said. The world said, uh, go to the dance. You went to the dance. Listen to this music. You listen to dress a certain way. You dress a certain way. Whatever the world was telling us to do, that's what we did. <clears throat> According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. You know what's wrong with the world and always has been wrong with the world? The devil runs it. The devil runs it. You say, what's wrong with them all them politicians in Washington? Well, somewhere in the, 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 the back of it, guess who's running it? He said, well, I thought God was on the throne. He is. But he, he, it's like he's appointed the devil, the manager, and he has to come to God and say, God, can I do this? God says, well, okay, do that or don't do that. So the day-to-day -day running of it, he leaves to Satan. And he, and he does a good job. I, I wonder if Satan had a bank account, how much would be in that bank account? Oh, billions and trillions and trillions and trillions and zillions of dollars. You know, the world has no trouble doing what they want to do. Uh, if they want to put up a, 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 some kind of entertainment uh, complex or amusement park, they do that. If they want to build movie theaters everywhere, they do that. If they want to put a bar room on every corner, they do that. It seems like the world has an inexhaustible well of things to do bad with. And of course you get politicians involved and they, they profess they're helping everybody. A lot of times they're not. They're not. They think they are. Uh, but notice that the devil works behind the scenes. Among whom also we had our conversation in times past in the lust of our flesh. So not only is the world and the devil at the fault, but when we were lost, we were at fault. We were doing things we knew better. We were doing things that violated our conscience. We were doing things that uh, we knew deep down were not the right things, but we wanted to do them, so we did them anyway. Sometimes when you're a kid, it's just something that doesn't seem like much to an adult, but it still is wrong as some adult going out and doing some horrible thing because the attitude in the heart. And believe me, I've run across some teenagers and some young people that have rotten attitudes. 
That's why when JT came down the other day and we had prayer with him, I was on his side because he was scared of God. He wanted to get together with God. He was more concerned about what God's word said and how to please God than he was even of his own parents. That's, that's my kind of kid. Filling, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. See, our thinking processes are on the wrong course. And we're by nature children of wrath even as others. We had wrong desires, we had wrong thinking, and we had wrong reactions to what God was doing. We were on the wrong way. We were going the wrong way. So when you get saved, you start going the right way. And then God says something else. You turn to the right, and when you turn to the right, well, God says, keep on going. Keep on going. Go, go to that. And that leads us to other people. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We keep walking the right way, and you know we're going to bump into someone. You know, why do we bump into them? Because they're going the wrong way. We're going this way, they're going that way. We bump into them, we stop them and say, Hey, I got a message for you. That's what God wants us to do. The right the right way, the right thing. Psalm 107 verse 7 says, And he led them forth by the right way. He led them forth by the right way. Talking about the children of Israel. God wants to lead you in the right way. And he knows the way that everybody needs to go. Now, your way may not be my way. I mean, not everybody's called to go to the Caribbean to be a missionary and plant churches. Some people have to stay here and get jobs and support those people. Not everybody's called to be in a pulpit. Not everybody's called to be a deacon. Uh, but you are called to do something for God and to go the way He leads you in the way. Um, we need to go. We need to go. You know, Jesus said He was the way in John 14, 6. So, what the way do you go? Well, you go and you go with Jesus because He is the way. No matter what way God's got you going, He's the way. I don't know if you've ever studied the Duke of Wellington. You, know, you remember the Duke of Wellington, the guy that conquered Napoleon? He was a Christian. Now, he, he wasn't one of these Christians that he didn't stand up on the street corner and preach or pass out drugs. He was part of the, the government of England. He was a pretty... Uh, heavy duty guy as far as the government and one day he was talking to one of these little uh, clergymen there in, in the church of England and uh, he asked him um, he says uh, how are you getting along with the propagation of the gospel abroad there's uh, he he had been reading his bible and he knew that preachers were supposed to spread the word everywhere I guess he believed that verse about going unto the whole world and uh, he says, is there any chance that the, the Hindus in India will become Christians? At that time, uh, England had just colonized India. And the guy kind of uh, hemmed and hawed, and he finally said, oh, oh, no, I don't see anything like that happening in India. Well... You didn't tell the Duke of Wellington anything like that. If he asked you how the thing was going, he, he was used to soldiers saying, Yes, sir. We'll be done, sir. He said, Well, what have you got to do with it? What are your marching orders, sir? And then he quoted in Mark 16, Going to all the world, preach the gospel, whatever creature. Well, that little clergyman kind of crawled away. <laughs> you never were dressed down till you were dressed down by the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> he, he was something. Look, God tells us to go. You say, well, I can't go everywhere. Well, that's why we send missionaries. That's why we have evangelists. That's why sometimes Brother Jeff gets in a car or a plane and goes somewhere and preaches. That's why this brother goes around. He's trying to get the gospel everywhere that he can. and Because that's what God has him doing. Um, we're to go. That's a plain direction. Go. He told Jeremiah, go. 
that not only did he give him directions to go, but he said, deliver the message. What good would a missionary be if he didn't deliver the message? And I've heard stories about these kind of things where a guy goes down, he builds him a house down on the mission field and he has a little compound and boy, it, things are really cushy. You know, he's got a little group that comes to his church and, uh, and, and but he kind of just lives within those walls. I've heard stories like that. No. The missionaries we have, they go. They go. We just bought a couple of them some vehicles so they could go. And they go to the highways and the byways. They go into little corners of the country that most of the ones in the city, the city missionaries don't want to go to. They, they, they go into places and they talk to people that no one's ever talked to before. That's the kind of people we got. Then we have, a, like Brother, we call him Pepe Le Pew. That's not his name. It's, his name is John Louis Van Maris. He's a missionary to France. Uh, he's a Frenchman. And he has an American wife. And he came to the United States and got, got an education and he got saved. And God called him to go back to France and start churches. Well, he has had the hardest time. Because France don't like Bible-believing Baptists. They just don't. So he's up in the corner over there by Belgium. And he's been there for years and years and years and years. And I remember having a talk with Brother Bill. And he would say, is this guy ever going to do anything? And, and then he came to give us a report. And we found out he was doing, he was doing his dead-level best. But everywhere he went, there was roadblocks put up in front of him. According to French law now, he can't even talk to anybody under 12 years old. He just can't. It's, it's against the law for him as a non-Catholic to talk to somebody under 12 years old. Well, that kind of limits the Sunday school, don't you think? And he's having a hard time getting space to have a church. He's finally founded a church. But it took him decades. Say, what about that guy? Well, he's going. He's doing as much as the guy over there in Haiti or the guy over there in Papua New Guinea or the guy over there in Malawi, Africa. It's just a different way. And, and that tells us that you have to go the way God tells you to go here. But wherever you do go, you tell the message. It says, what's our message? It's Jesus Christ. And this is a personal message. Uh, the Bible says uh, here, tell him. Tell him. Look at verse 2. And, and tell him. And it was go up to Zedekiah and said, look, God's got a message for you. You need to go to your neighbor or the people you work with and say, God's got a message for you. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes that's scary. If you want to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this is a record of how God used Paul to reach the Thessalonians. In chapter 2 verse number 9. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 9. Uh, and he's, Paul's kind of reminiscing here. He says, For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable to any of you. He said, I came around and I preached to y'all, but I didn't ask for any offerings. I didn't live off of nobody. I went and had a little tent business and I made my own money so I could just spend my time preaching to you. You had to worry about you didn't have to worry about taking care of me. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Now he said, not only did we work so you didn't have to support us, but we behaved ourselves. I'm going to say this, please, Christian. If you're going to tell people about Christ, behave yourself. And we've had people in this church that didn't do that. We've got one in jail right now didn't behave himself. And he was a mouthy guy, too. The whole time talking. As you know how we...
exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God who hath called you into his kingdom and glory. For this cause also we thank God without ceasing. Because when ye receive the word of God. Now I want you to underline that phrase. Which ye heard of us. Ye received it not as the word of men. But as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. I want to point something else. When you go tell the message, you're going to have to work at it a little bit. You just can't go to them and say, Jesus died on the cross, he was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scripture. See ya. That technically is the gospel I just gave you. But it's not a very good message. Paul said, look, I went to you like a daddy. And, I, and, and like a daddy, I kind of set you down on my knee and I had a talking with you. And I went and saw how you lived and, 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 I, and I tried to help you this way and that way. And eventually I got you around where you'd listen to what I said and believed what I said. And that took a lot of hard work. Look at our church. Man, our church struggled. Our church was started in 1981 by John Wheat. Went to a mission and be a missionary in Australia. And then finally, Brother Bill took over uh, not too many years after that. And we worked here for 30 years. And, and, and uh, you say, well, we're not a big congregation. Yeah, we're still working at it. But you know, God's got us, got us coming along. God's got us coming along. You just have to go at God's pace and keep working at it. And don't get discouraged. You work at it. And then you witness. You always witness. You witness with your behavior. You witness with your exhortations, your preaching. And you witness with some comfort. And, and you charge people. Uh, you know, you, you tell them what's right and what's wrong. In other words, you give them a charge. You kind of charge their batteries. Because living in this world is discouraging. If you're lost, some people get mighty discouraged living in lost people. That's why the suicide rate. It's so high. People don't know what to do, so they just end it all. The witness. Go give them the message. No matter what you do, give them the message. You say, well, it's not working. Give it some time. Give it some time. The gospel is like yeast. You put it in the dough and you mix it up, and then you let it sit. And it starts working. And you don't just mix it all up and stick it in the oven. You end up with funny looking bread that don't taste very well. But you let that dough sit there and you let it rise. And then you take it and you knead it again. Pop all the bubbles out and redo it again. Just let it sit there again. And you give it two or three rises. You're going to build up lots of nice bubbles in that bread. And you're going to build some flavor in that bread. And you stick it in that oven. You bring it back out. And boy, that bread tastes good. Because you've let have time to work. The trouble is we just give the gospel flat and we expect it just to... Look, the gospel's not a magic wand. It has to take time to work in people's hearts. And it takes... It, it, we have to keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. I, I mean, look at the YouTube thing. I, I've been on the YouTube for nearly two years now. I finally got one lady that sent me back a request for a Bible course after all that time. One lady. Finally. Last week. Well, that's the first one. I'm waiting for the next one now. And the next one. And the next one. And the next one. But they'll come if I keep at it. Now, if I quit, they won't. Finally, he gave them a message that was what I call doom or deliverance. See, God gives us a choice. And it's not a multiple choice. It's just one or two. This one. Or that one. You cannot believe God. Or you can take his word. And you can believe him. And he'll deliver you. That was that simple. Zedekiah. You go do what I said. I'll deliver you. You don't do what I say. I'm not going to deliver you. You're going to have doom. And that's how simple the gospel is. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 13. We looked at verses 9 through 13, verse 13 said, For this cause we thank God without ceasing, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard of us, people have to receive the message. 
And until they receive the message, your job ain't done yet. You got to keep preaching at them till they receive the message. Over and over and over again if you have to. Say, well, how do people, how do people really end up dying and going to hell? They do it because they resist the message. And if they resist long enough, time's going to be up. Time's going to be up. God will give them that second chance. God will give them. I know people God gave four, or five, ten chances to get saved. Thank God they finally got saved, most of them. Most people aren't that stubborn. But I've seen some people that were that stubborn. They're just not going to believe what God said, no matter what. Romans 13 verse 2 says, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God. Now that's talking about governments and things like that, but the principle is still the same. God gave His Word, God gave the ordinances in His Word and the words and, and the gospel, and when you resist the stuff that God gives you, you resist in God. So what that verse means to the gospel But there comes a day when God's going to say, okay, it's time to put up or shut up. Make a choice. Make a choice. Get saved or don't, but make a choice. John chapter 5, Jesus said this in verse 28. John chapter 5, 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming... In the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. Look, you can resist the gospel all you want to, but there's coming a day, even after you die, when you're going to hear voice, God's voice one more time. And there shall come forth they that have done good, in our case, believe the gospel and get saved under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil and have rejected the gospel and not taken Christ up at his free offer under the resurrection of damnation. Jesus said it's that simple. And by then it's too late. Now as long as someone is breathing, there's hope for them. That's why there's nothing wrong with going down to the hospital. I've been down there many times with some guy that's dying trying to lead him to Christ. Fifteen minutes later, they were gone. I've been down at the rescue mission. Brother Vic used to go with me. Some of them fellows didn't have much longer to live. They were just hanging on, some of them old dudes. And you preach the gospel to them because they haven't got much time. Brother John used to go to the nursing home. Why did he go to that? Because there's people that didn't have much time left. But they were still around. They were still kicking. As long as you're still kicking, there's hope. There's hope. A professional diver said that uh, he had in his house what would probably strike a visitor as a very strange chimney ornament. The shells of an oyster were hung up on his mantel place. And in one of the oysters was caught a piece of paper. And if you went over and looked at the piece of paper, you would find a gospel track. And he says one day he was at the bottom of the sea and he saw this oyster on a rock. And when he went over to it and detached it, it had a piece of paper caught in it. And so he said there and, and read this piece of paper underwater through his goggles. And of course it told him the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it so impressed him that God had gone to so much trouble to bring him the message, he figured he probably needed to get saved right there and then so he bowed his head in the water and while he was still in the water he got saved so when he come up he preserved this he preserved this little oyster and this little tract and hung it on his mouth and everybody came into his house and said what in the world is that and he'd tell them a story tell them a story 
Look, God works hard to get the gospel to people. He calls people like me. He calls people like you. He calls people like our missionaries. You say, God called me? Yeah, God called you. Every Christian is responsible for telling the new good news. Now, thank God he doesn't send us to Zedekiah the king. Frankly, reading Jeremiah, Zedekiah was kind of a fruitcake, if you ask me. But, you know, you got to preach to who God sends you to. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says this about the Lord. Some of you know this verse. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Oh, aren't you glad of that? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. I didn't have much time last night before bed. But if you go to Wikipedia or somewhere on the internet, you can look up how many people die every minute on the planet Earth. It's a staggering number. But every minute that goes by, more people die and go to eternity. We need to keep those things in mind. We get so caught up in getting up, eating breakfast, going to work, eating lunch, coming home, dealing with the kids or whatever, watching TV, going to bed, getting up, going, I mean, that we lose sight of the eternal things. Jeremiah said, look, Zedekiah, I'm telling you that the end is near. This guy with his great big army is going to come and, and, and clean your plow. If you do what I tell you to do, you can get out of it. But you've got to do exactly what I tell you to do. Well, that's all the gospel is. It's believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. To as many as received him, to them give you power to become the sons of God. Even then believe on his name. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world. Not to, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. And not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not of works that any man should boast. It's so simple. It's so simple. It's not hard. Which is good. Because if it was complicated, you wouldn't do it. Heavenly Father, help us. God, the only invitation I have to give is go out and tell people. Go and tell. The choice is up to them, God. That's not our business. That's their business. So Lord, help us to be faithful. And Lord, help us to go find someone to go tell. God, not... Tomorrow, but today. And then tomorrow, help us to find someone else to tell. God, help us to be faithful. I believe the time of your coming is right around the corner. And God, I want to stand before you and I want you to say to me, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Help us in this hour, Lord. Help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.